How is your mental health, you know, through all this? How is your mental health? No one really talks about your mental health. Addictions, you know, you, you know, there's, there's, there's been reports out there. Talk to me. You know, I'm an ex-addict myself. I can see the signs. Yeah, I'm not allowed. No, I'm. Um, it's, certain people are allowed to have mental health. I'm not. Yeah, that's how it is. It's like, it's like, I done a video the other day when I realised about it. In a seven day period, I had Muslims turn up at my mum's house. They turned up at another lady's house looking for me. Four of them. Um, they said they were, they rang me up. I got the video recordings. They said they're going to kidnap my daughters from school. They're going to drug them. They're going to rape them. Um, These are. This is, this is the Telford gang that I've been investigating. Okay. Please don't do anything about it. Um, so I've had, and sometimes I don't think about it, but the, and, and do you know when I really did think about it? So I, I just plough through. And I, I, I'll be honest, I, th I always thought it was weak to talk about it and that as men, you should just carry on and crack on. And that's how, and then and then I realised, so I had a court case. I've had a court case. I'm, I'm waiting to court now on the 1st of August. I've not had one clear period where I haven't had court cases for, since I started the English Defence League in 2009. Yeah. I had a court case at the High Court of London uh, for a civil case where I lost and they've, they've hit me for nearly a million pounds. Now, when I come out of that court case, I represented myself because I couldn't afford to pay the £100,000 that they wanted for the legal representation because I'm getting no legal aid. So I represent myself and I come out of that court case and my head was about a bang. Yeah. I feel, I, I don't feel I'm under attack. I'm under attack from everywhere. Yeah. My biggest fear is a Muslim walking up to me, killing me in the street. It's not, that's not my biggest fear. I don't fear that. Yeah? My biggest fear is the establishment and what they're doing and what they're planning next. And the games they've played with imprisonment, with moving me. Like they put me on, they put me on 22 weeks solitary confinement, but you're not allowed to, you're only allowed to do four weeks because it messes with your mental health. So after four weeks, they moved me from Wandsworth prison to Bedford prison, straight down the block. To start it again. Bedford, Woodhill, Woodhill, Wandsworth, Wandsworth, Wayland. Yeah? And all the games they play in the same, in, in the same period. And then the fear, I guess it all comes from fear. Because if I said I did, I was terrified when I go to jail. Yeah. but I won't back down from, I won't say I don't need protection because I'm not going with no nonsense. I've, I've done nothing wrong. Yeah. I'm terrified when I, I've been terrified lots of times. Yeah. And more terrifying because I think, think deeply about things is the consequence to my family and my children and what I put them through. And um, so all those things and whether you, I don't know if I realised the effect it has or the weight it carries. And I went to a, when I come out, I, I had this court case and I go on a bender. Yeah. I have done for years. Um, I don't. I didn't see as. I don't see as I had an had an addiction, because if I want to go two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks without going on a bender, I'll go those weeks without going on a bender. But I'll always go back on the bender. Yeah? And when I say on a bender, when I hit the drink, I don't drink out of enjoyment. I drink in as much as I can, as quick as I can, as fast as I can. And it's more like I don't know how you describe it. Whether it's a form of self harm. I said, looking at it, you're fucking just ruining yourself for those. And or, or whether it's called escapism. Whether I look at it and think of it as escaping, I'm trying to escape the reality of who I am and what my fate, what my life is, or what my consequence of my belief is, or what or maybe I'm maybe for that period, for that period when you're on a bender, whether it be 12 hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours, for that period, that's gone. Are you sniffing as well? I was, yeah, I was, um, I was. If I go on a bender, um, Do you ever have a pipe? Nah, never. I've never touched anything like that. Nah, nah, just recreational. And, and, and but then it's like. That takes you, and I didn't realise it takes you, yeah? So I come out, it's, it's COVID, I finished this court case. Um, my house, when I was out of the country, people were sent, and this is all organised, yeah? Shamina Begnum's lawyer handed over live on... So my, I receive, the police come to the house, I'm sat with my wife, and the police come to the house and they say, we have an Osman warning. And an Osman warning is a warning that's given to you by the British government to say that we have in, that they have in, intel that someone's going to kill you. Yeah? So they come, I've had six of them. They come and they give me one with a wife and they said, the intel is a group called Antifa have armed themselves with weapons, with firearms. They are planning on burning your house. They're planning on killing you. Yeah. So I said, okay, four weeks later. So I, I put that online. Yeah. I put the video over online. The first person to comment is a bloke called Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Akanji. He's the lawyer for Shamina Begnum. He's a lawyer for Michael Adabalajo. He's every terrorist lawyer. Yeah? He makes a comment under that Osman one. So he knows there's a threat to our life from Antifa. What does he go and do? He goes and hires an Antifa activist. Yeah? And it, they sit with cameras like this. I'll, I'll send you the video. They hand him my children's address. They know I'm, they comment, they know I'm in Latvia. Yeah? I land back off the plane, I've got a message from my dad saying, dad, please help, there's people here. Yeah? I'm like, what the fuck? And they've gone and live streamed where my kids are. 
They've given the name of the road, the location. My kids had to leave their house that day. Later that night, the Antifa activist made a video saying, Tommy, and I, I'll, send, I'll send you this, Tommy, I'm going to mince your kids. All right, it's going to kill my kids. All of these things are going on. Now, this is all an effect, yeah? All has an effect. The pressure of it. This is where it gets dark for me. I come out. the next. So, first thing I do when I get home is I think, I find out everything about the man. Who's come to my house? Where's he live? Um, I had two security officers who had made their way up in the EDL, from the EDL, and they were close to me. I don't know, yeah, but they were helping me with security. One of them has rang me up and said, do you want us to light him up? I've gone, no, I don't. And straight away, I thought... I don't, and then my friends have come round because, and people have come round wanting to do something to this man who's threatened to kill my kids. I said no. Thank God I said no, yeah. Because the next day I've seen a Mercedes van around the side. I've got a video of this. Yeah? I've seen a van, so I pull up next to it, and the bloke looks at me, and he looks at his mate, and he looks back at me. And he goes, "All right, Tommy." And does his window. All right, Tommy. I said, "Who the fuck are you?" He went, "What?" I said, "Who the fuck are you, and what are you doing here?" He goes, "We're just on our lunch break." I said, what do you do for a job? He goes, I'm a plumber, mate. I said, so which house are you working in? Point to me which house you're working in. And he just looks. And he goes to start his car. So I jump out of the car and stand in front of the car. I said, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah? He goes, put the phone down, Tommy. Put the phone down. You can say, I'll send you this video. So I put, I put the phone down. And I said, who are you? He says, we're police. I said, right, what, what are you doing? Yeah? They've got a whole listening, fuck, the whole van full of listening stuff outside my house. They're sat around the back. So I believe, what I, was, I believe this was planned provocation for me to conspire to hurt him. The minute I'd have made a comment, I'd be on a conspiracy charge. That's what I believe. Now, I am a paranoid, and I've been driven to paranoia. And what I believe, and, and, and some of this stuff, and I've been targeted, I've, I'm putting a documentary out this week, which is going to expose a lot of this. It's going to expose that groups who work with the British government have come to people, they've blackmailed them, yeah? They've paid them tens of thousands of pounds, and they create a source of information. That source of information then says something, and the media run it around the world, yeah? But I've got the proof that five or six of these sources of information have been created. You know, Johnny Adair, like he's no. uh, he's in it. He's in it. yeah. Well, I got a phone call from him that I've recorded, yeah, because he he clarifies this certain woman got twenty thousand pound. Then she appears on Panorama lying. Yeah, that, I've got all the proof of that. So I've all the paranoia of what they're doing and how they. I know they want to lock me up, and I I know I've done three months, five months, and another four months of solitary confinement, and I know the adverse effect that had on me. It, it absolutely destroyed me. I went into jail one person, come out another person. It's insane. I come out a totally different person. And I didn't realise it though, yeah? I didn't realise, I did realise it. I had issues, but um, but a lot of those issues then, so only then, so I, I needed a break from life. And I come out of jail and I don't feel, if I walk down the street, everywhere I walk, I'm out. I have to be ready to have a fight. And I don't, it's not a nice feeling. I'm not, when I go into jail, I have to become a different person than I am. I have to be ready for violence, yeah? And I have to psych myself up to be horrible, to be a horrible man, yeah? So I have all this, I come out, I come out of this court case and I feel like I'm cracking up, yeah? And I booked myself in for 28 days. Um, and in all honesty, for a break. So when I, I went to a re rehabilitation facility where they give intense therapy. And, um, and I sat there. And for the first few days, I was thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. And, I was, and I was seeing the different people were on heroin. I've never touched heroin. I was looking down at people on heroin. Or I, I would have used to look down on people on heroin. I was listening to some people alcoholics. Some people were mega successful. And then when they said, why are you here? I said, I'm here for a break. And they were like, what? I said, I'm here for a break, mate. Like, I just, because they take your phone, yeah? I willingly went, yeah? I wanted to book myself in. I said, I'm here for a break. And I didn't see that I had an addiction, yeah? At all. I'd have argued with anyone that I haven't got an addiction. Because if I don't want to drink or I didn't want to do drugs, I'd never do drugs. That's what I felt, yeah? But then I started listening to people talking. I was thinking, yeah, my, I've, I say that, yeah, my, my wife said that to me and I started thinking, Jesus, man. And then I started thinking about the adverse effect and I always live my life by don't, no surrender. I don't have a good time when I drink or if I go on a sesh. I have a terrible time. I'm terrified. I'm, 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 I'm not having a good time ever, but then I still do it again two weeks later. It's mad. And then I, the, the insanity of telling myself that it'll be different this time, it'll be, it'll be different this time. And it's not. Ever, yeah? So understanding that, and then I spoke, so I'm sat around in this room, and they, and then for the first time in 15 years or whatever, mm. I'm speaking about my fears. And what's your fear? And then you write, and you go in depth. You have to write out lots of stuff. Effects you've had on family. What would you say to your son at this time? And it gets so deep, yeah? It was such a best beneficial experience for me and a fascinating experience. 
I get passionate. I sat there and go, I sat there thinking, I live my life by no surrender. And then I realised that every time I touch a drink or get on a sesh, I'm surrendering. And what am I surrendering to? Because I'm trying to escape who I am, which I can't. I'm trying to run away from my life, which I can't. I still, after 13 years, haven't accepted the reality of who, who, of what my life is. And that's what I'm probably always trying to escape. But the negative impact I'm having on my children, the negative impact I'm having on my family um, is created from this. And then I sat around listening to some of the, I met some of the most wonderful people I've ever, ever met in my life. Whether there was a, a girl hooked on heroin, beautiful girl, lovely life, lovely, a, a horrific story of her life. Because you have to write out all the trauma in your life. I've seen a lot of trauma. I've had a lot of trauma. And you're trying to work out what your trigger moments is. I don't, mine isn't that. Mine is what's ahead. Mm. That's what my thing is. I'm, I'm scared of what's coming in my life. And not just what's coming for me, but what's coming for my kids. Because I believe I've been targeted. Will my kids get a job? I don't think they will. Are they going to get a job in any big company? I can't get a bank account. Every bank's closed me down. Five banks closed me down. They didn't just close me down, they closed my dad down. Um, so my, it's, it, and it comes from fear with me, and I realise that. But it was the first time, and I sat, and when I spoke in a group, there's 20 people. I cried my eyes out from start to finish every time I spoke. It was insane. But I felt great afterwards. And the first thing I'd done when that happened is I, I said to the counsellor, dude, I said, I need to bring home. I need to get my son a counsellor. Oh, don't, man. Wow, oh, mate, fucking hell. No, listen, it, it affects everyone. Well, it affects I everyone. always say, I, I'm, I think men are meant to be strong or be tough. So I say, to my, I, I didn't realise my son watched me um, in, where was we? We was in Hitchin. There's a video, I'll send you it. I'm driving in my car, I've got my son and his mate. I see some black lad with his hood up, two other Asian lads. And he goes up, at the start of COVID, and he coughs in this old woman's face. And I thought, did I just actually see that? I'm looking in my mirror because I'm waiting to get out of the junction. So I opened up my door. I said, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And he was doing it so purposely in her face. And then they turned around to me. Uh, uh, and I said, what the fuck? He's given her a big, and he gave her a big black eye. He, was, was, he gets 22 weeks in jail. But I'm watching it. And I said, what the fuck are you doing, bruv? Right? And then they turn their attention to me. And they say, oh, don't, you fucking racist. I say, shut up. And, and then one of them sm smacks me in the car. I get back in my car. My son's there. My son's videos in it. Video in it. The video goes viral everywhere. I get back in my car. I don't think of this. I get back in the car and I'm ready to drive off and I just lose the head and I jump back out of the car and start fighting them all. And then um, I never thought of the effect that would have on a, on a child yeah. of my son. Because I said to my son, you need to, I sort of were like, you need to be ready because life's not good. You need, to under, you need to be, you need to defend yourself at all times, yeah? Because he's having to be born into this environment that probably I've created through my belief. And then, uh, so for, that happens. And then we go to Spain. No, that happens. Then I go out, then I talk about Black Lives Matter and they come and petrol bomb the car. So the car's blown up. We've got no hotels are open at the start of COVID. We fly to Croatia. We've got nowhere to live. We fly to Croatia. From Croatia, I fly to Marbella. My friend put me up in Marbella in that place. I'm in Marbella. I go to a restaurant with my kids. And this video goes viral as well. So I'm sat there. There's about eight Asian lads over here. So I go in the toilet twice, because I think if any of them got a problem, come in the toilet and say something to me. I've got my kids with me. I had five kids with me, because I'm my daughter's friend. I go into the toilet. They don't come in. I sit back down. At the end, he comes over. I stick fucking holes in you. Yeah, This scumbag. I tried to find him. He, go, he, go, he says, I'll stick holes in you. Um, and, it, and I say, I'm with my fucking kids. And he goes, fuck your kids. And my kids sitting there. They start crying. And, uh, and from then, my son started having panic attacks. And he, um, he wouldn't go anywhere. Oh, damn, yeah. What's so, next, Tom? Yeah. We, we could talk f for hours, like, and, you know, dissect things and find solutions to things. But it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to meet you and, 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 and see where you're coming from with everything. Because, you know, it's not all what's out on the media. It's not what's portrayed on I the media. I always say, if you... Stuff. Don't believe what you read in the media. Listen to what I say. Don't see what they say about me. And I, in fact, this next film I'm going to do is a massively important film because I will prove that the stories you're reading are lies. Uh, not, not, but yeah, I ain't perfect and I admit that. So, but I ain't for, you know you started off about hate? Mm. You would never be able to put up or go through the life I've gone through if it was to do with hate. Yeah? Mm. It just wouldn't do it. No one could do it. I say, so I, I, it's not, I love, it's full of love. I love my kids. I love my country. I love, I love my community. And what's happened to it is, is wrong and someone's got to talk about it.